the power of social media and and how we use social media to build relationships with the next generation, right? Which is a very convoluted topic that can go in a lot of different directions. We had a lot of great conversations. Um, but I think themes of what you're hearing today, right, is that the reality is, is that it's no longer, which I know Jenna touched on earlier, it's no longer a Super Bowl first world, but it is a social first world. And for many of us to make a brand background, a little bit about myself, I uh, came from traditional brand agency background, worked in a very small agency called the Overnot for a long time, um, and started to see that evolution of chasing kind of that Super Bowl ad, as everyone said, like, what is that video campaign and how does that how does that water fall down to what is that social first or that influencer first idea with these behavioral platforms that's going to allow us to stay top of mind and tell authentic brand stories. And so, which is how I found myself that idea, uh, given the opportunity to really lead kind of win influencer first and embracing brand stories and then taking influencer social first away from, again, a social media strategy to an integrated marketing strategy. So, uh, excited as, as we bring in the rest of the panel today and I'll let them each in individually introduce themselves to to kind of dive into this world though that I think is really interesting because the depth many of us <coughs> marketers realize there's no longer a playbook. There's no longer a one size fits all approach that was a little bit of a safety net for all of us and kind of how we went to market. And so, you know, with this kind of diverse panel and in different categories, it's it's great to hear hear kind of the the honest truth about what we're doing to kind of be successful, but also some of the things that have been a little bit of scary, uh, hard to adapt, hard to kind of navigate through, and, and we're finding those wins to learn uh, and embrace as we're, as we're finding our way forward. So with that, I want to start with just, again, the, the word authenticity is was thrown around a lot today, and the idea of kind of being real and, and showing off as your authentic self in the social media space. So we're going to the person, uh, just kind of starting overall with, again, how authenticity or how you've been able to kind of get place authenticity is to see tell the top jobs in the world. Sure. Um, so I'm Carson. Uh, I've been with Papa John's for over a year as social media manager. And for us, um, authenticity comes through in our day-to-day -day interactions. Uh, as social media manager, I'm closest to the customers who are on social media and engaging with them daily. So for us, it's important to be not only self-aware, but also to understand our audience, understand what they're talking about, understand their lingo. And so for me, it's about constantly being on, I mean, not constantly being on social, but understanding, um, you know, what's popular, what's trending. I do a daily trend report. Um, so we're in the mix of, you know, our younger audiences and um, for us that that's been huge, especially on emerging platforms like TikTok and commenting on Instagram reels. Um, so for us, it's a, there, it's a balance of, you know, you want to promote the product, but you also want to be self-aware. Um, we <coughs> see even an example I can provide on that is, um, I see a lot of times TikToks where, you know, there's different filters of, of competing fast food restaurants or people might not choose Papa John's right away. And instead of shying away from engaging with those type, that type of content um we'll engage and and be self-aware and say like why didn't like we'll we'll try to be funny and take a um more authentic approach um and that actually goes a long way another thing we like to do is i handle um sending surprise and delight gift packages um so just really honing in on our brand fans um whether that's uh key opinion leaders and influencers or um, just a customer who's an avid fan. And um, since I've been with the brand for over a year now, we've seen um, an increase in just the daily interactions we have. And, it, and it's consistently the same people. So we're, we're constantly trying to build those uh, brand fans. Yeah, that's great. And then Rick, did you want to kind of add on to that? So a little bit too, is this Delta navigates that, that social yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Rick Newkirk. Very nice to meet everybody. Um, I've been at Delta for about 10 years and I've been in Delta marketing for like three years. Um, so I have a background in the business before that. But um, I want to touch on community a little bit later um, because I think uh, Carson spoke really nicely about um, maintaining a good community. But in terms of trends and trend spotting, um, you know, 
it can be tough for a brand to wade into trends when it's maybe not relevant for like Delta Airlines to go out and do like a grimace shake, right? It's probably, probably not going to resonate. It's going to feel pretty inauthentic. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to find the ones that fit more naturally with what we are. And I think to do that, you have to understand really well who you are and what is important to you. So, um, you know, Delta isn't just a uh, provider of airfare, right? Like we pride ourselves on being welcoming, elevated, and caring. That's the difference that, that we make for customers. Um, so I had I have one example. I don't know if we're able to show it, but... Um, this is my... Yeah, this is it. <laughs> uh, let me... This is my meal. I call this girl dinner. Girl, girl dinner. Girl dinner. Girl dinner. Girl dinner. Girl dinner. That's beautiful. Uh, so if y'all remember a couple of months ago, I guess this was a, a pretty decent trend on TikTok. And um, our team was able to, you know, figure out this is our end, right? Like air travel can be very stressful for people. And we try to take out as much stress as possible. One of the ways we do that is through our food and beverage offerings, specifically Biscoff cookies. It's like a, almost a sub brand of ours at this point. It's not, but, um, uh, being able to show, like, when you're on board, these are some of the things that we provide that give you a nice experience that make you want to travel. And doing it with, you know, a, a, a trend that was that was popping off at the time. Um, I think it was a really nice way for us to be um, authentic and, you know, while also engaging with culture. Absolutely. So, and, and the kind of building on that topic of kind of chasing trends and, and how you you know, want to make sure you kind of dive in feet first. We also know as, as brand owners and brand leaders that with that comes risk reward analysis, right? And, and so we've seen kind of the reward that comes, but also potentially the risk that comes with, you know, being able to evaluate, is this right from a brand safety standpoint? Is it telling the right story? Is it going to resonate or is it going to have kind of that adverse effect? So, want to turn it over uh, first person to talk a little bit just about like, again, risk analysis, you guys look at risk when you evaluate uh, campaigns and these that will be kind of jump in on track. Yeah, so for us, we work closely with our legal team, especially for platforms like TikTok, um, where there's copyright um, and trending sounds. Um, so we work very closely with our legal team. Um, and for us, it's a matter of does this fit our brand and what we stand for. And for Papa John's, that's quality, obviously better ingredients, better pizza. Everybody knows the slogan. Um, but that's our primary focus. Um, we have other core values as well. But in terms of our content, we try to show that quality promise um, that our pizza should have. So we evaluate it um, based on that and then you know, we assess internally if we can accomplish it. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, when we if we are going to execute upon a trend, that it's in a timely manner and that we're not late to the trend because um, that comes off as inauthentic. Um, so there's a number of factors um, that we look at in, in determining um, if we're able to um, enact on a trend. But, but, yeah, we work very closely with legal to make sure there's no issues. So. Great. And Obviously, then with risk analysis, kind of reward and, and something that we've interviewed to talk about is evaluating ROI, right? And how do you defend, you know, the time investment it takes to search for trends, evaluate trends, and, and latch on to trends, of, and what is that and what that you get on the other side? So, go for it. Yeah, so I told the, uh, I think like most of you guys have had uh, a public grant for these initiatives along the same time. So, we might have like a above the line grant campaign. Uh, that, you know, the ROI is always there, right? And that's the media mix model, we imagine you kind of know. Uh, we were talking about real time, I think day in and day out, we're always defending what that ROI is. So chasing trends and this always going to result in someone buying a couple of the next day. Uh, but we know we have to do it anyway. So similar to Carson, the work with our legal team and text me day in and day out. Like, as long as we feel like we have social ROI covered, we can kind of evaluate that risk as jumping in on trends. I think for me, sometimes it's like, it's risky to be there, but it's riskier not to be. Uh, we have that. I work on the hydration brands at Google, so we have that wider and water example up there. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guys, really 
really Siri of you, like, politely. You know? I, I'm still off topic here. Um, hi, I'm Jacqueline. I work at Coca-Cola, and I work on the hydration brands and the nutrition brands um, and also portfolio plays. So just to back it up a little, so we have um, – we have a couple different initiatives going at all times on social. So we have our bright campaigns kind of above the line. ROI there is always measurable. We have our media mix models, we have attribution, we have all that stuff. Where it's harder to defend, and I think all of us encounter this every single day, is what is that ROI on jumping in on trends? So um, for vitamin water, it's probably the trendiest brand we have on social media. The talk track, or at least you know for me, it's riskier not to be there. So we kind of weigh that with our legal team to say like, okay, what is the risk here? What's the box? Is it a cease and desist? Is it a $5 million lawsuit? And what is the ROI on actually being there? And it's it's brand affinity, which is hard to measure, but you got to play in that space. So, And then we have the other example. Yeah, so this is a little bit of like the scale of the risk and reward. So we text our legal team, which they will <laughs> Um, So on the left there, it's like, okay, this is pretty safe. This is just our product. In the middle, this was actually our take on Girl Dinner. Um, Girl Dinner... Uh, just between us with our legal team was a little too risky for Coca-Cola, so we did boy dinner. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, I don't know how this ever got through, um, we jumped in on the Barbie trend, which was probably one of the riskier things we've done this year. But at the end of the day, it was so topical. It, again, you know, we had to be there versus not. Great. And, and kind of building, again, on kind of that ROI and, and you know, risk reward, we all know, again, not being kind of a tried and true and proven tactic. We're fighting for those dollars in social and, and the impact of social, making sure that we can stretch those dollars as far as we can. So I'll hand it over to Marissa to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we were talking in prep for this and trend chasing um, and how does that impact our overarching strategy? And I think all of us were nodding our heads when we said, you know, Trends, whether it's from a social platform or content, like that should not be changing your social strategy. Your social strategy needs to remain the same and core to your brand. Yes, each year you may be making some adjustments that are going to reflect how has your demographics changed? How are the platforms now prioritizing certain types of content? Are your content bucket slightly adjusting? Um, but when it comes to proving out that value, you've hopefully already done that by selling in where the value is coming from through your strategy and what you're aiming to do and what you're driving through your social channels. Um, at Focus Brands, we're, we're the parent company of seven uh, food brands, Cinnabon, Indians, Carvel, Jamba, McAllister's, Schlotzky's, and Moe's. Um, and so my team handles all of the organic social content, partnerships, collaborations, and influencer work. Um, and so we're doing everything from a low budget, no budget standpoint. Um, and so that's where we get super crafty with stretching any of our dollars that we're spending in creating content to how can we... Um, recut, re-leverage, um, you know, we're working with our creative team and we're taking um, any silhouetted images and we're dropping them into unique meme formats. So not everything needs a shoot. We, uh, we've started what we're now calling content optimization shoots where yes, that might be a POP shoot for what we're needing to put in our locations, but we are extending it an extra half a day because guess what? That's slightly extra dollar spent on keeping the food stylist there, having the team there, we now just were able to crank out 30 pieces of original content for social um, for very minimal investment. So really um, driving that cross collaboration, we are a highly matrix organization and really making the connections between all of our teams um, and working hand in hand with our creative department. We also have um, a outside agency that partners with us to help us with that, our organic content. Um, but that scope doesn't cover everything. So we have to get super scrappy with our internal creative team, making those shoots work the hardest for us, recutting um, and really educating the brands on uh, when we are concepting, always thinking through and uh, partnering, educating with our creative teams of thinking through what is that social first lens of a content look like. So yes, you may be shooting your um, larger ad spot, but what is a slight tweak on how that shows up that now allows us to cut it and leverage it in social. So it is authentically social, <laughs> it's going to perform and it's not just a, a lift and shift of an ad that we know isn't gonna perform and just say, okay, well, at least we got one piece of content out of that. Um, it's really, it has been so much education and partnership with our creative teams to really make sure everybody understands how things are going to look and show up differently on social. Um, and across all of that, we're, we're um, having everybody become um, not necessarily social experts. That is our team's job, but 
having them understand and know they don't need to go as, as deep as us, but we are all expected to know a little bit of each other's role. Great. Well, transitioning a little bit, right, as we think about we're moving all these dollars to social, but really fully understanding the why. Why social? And it really comes down to the ability to make, to build trust in relationships. Consumers today are, are asking us to work harder to buy our trust, right? And to continue, continue to keep that trust, continue to keep that loyalty. Uh, you know, I, I joke all the time, I was like, before you can put up a billboard about here's the vacuum you should buy and everyone buys the vacuum. But yet, you know, with the attention economy we live in and all of the noise, it's so much harder to break through, create that relationship and maintain that relationship. And so as we think about earning trust online and building those communities that people want to be a part of and continue to be a part of, uh, kind of want to turn it over to the entire panel and talk a little bit about that importance and how you guys are, are building those communities and leveraging those communities uh, to tell your brand stories. I'll start real quick. Um, so for us, um, again, knowing uh, minimal budgets, we knew that the role that organic social plays is so incredibly critical to creating those relationships. And our brands have heavily leaned into community engagement and really creating that one-to-one -one relationship with our, um, our fans and followers. Um, it's the lifeblood for, for some of our brands. You know, we have Carvel ice cream that is a, going into the, a 90, their 90th year. Um, we have one of the smallest social communities across all our brands, but the highest engagement, right? Those, those fans and followers are core to our brand. Um, you'll have a brand like John Juice, like big nationally known, huge audience, um, huge power, again, incredibly, um, incredibly engaged audience, but maybe not as nice and lovable as the Carvel audience. They will tell us when we haven't um, made a smoothie correctly or something is off in our content. But that shows us that uh, when you can proper, when you know who your audience is, you can properly engage with them. Um, they can drive and make uh, business impacts. And so that's what our team and what I've challenged our team to do is, yes, we are here for driving brand love and awareness and engagement. And that is what our team thrives in, but to start thinking about that, that next click up that we can start now talking to our marketing teams in a language that they are understanding of what that, that like that follower, what is that engagement rate doing for the brand? Um, so we're not trying to make what we do, um, you know, inauthentic to our organic content, but really just showing what that impact is in more than just impressions, engagement rates, things like that. So really, really taking it to that next step, um, in a way that makes sense. Yeah, um, is this on the step? Yeah. <laughs> you guys have to tell me if it's in there. Um, so Coca-Cola, different brands, different strategies, but all important to build community. It just looks different for a brand like Coke Trademark versus like a vitamin water. Um, so I can speak to a little bit of both of those. Uh, similar to Marissa with different brands. So Coke Trademark, massive. People are not afraid to tell you how much they hate the Coca-Cola company. Coca-Cola, you guys all saw stuff like that. So the mandate for building community on that brand is to leave social media a better place than we found it. Um, it's a really wide strategy, but it does give us a little bit more of a purpose to lean into community with a brand that large. Um, for vitamin water, we actually do something totally different where we focus more on the micro communities. So we get asked all the time at Coca-Cola, sponsor me, sponsor me. And we are so corporate, we have this response like, we are not sponsoring anyone at this time. And people are like, that's not very cool. So two years ago, our social team came back and was like, okay, let's actually do something with this. Um, you have an example, but it's not that exciting. So I won't make you watch the visual. Um, so we came up with a response like, yes, we will sponsor you. Don't tell anyone. And you will become part of this micro community for vitamin water called the wet fam. The wet fam still exists. They have a private discord channel. We engage with them every single day. Our community managers are in there with prompts. They talk about family issues, they talk about products, they talk about pretty much everything. There is, if you ask me what the ROI on this, are we collecting first party data, are we selling things? I cannot tell you. But it's important for this brand to have this kind of community and it's really important also for us to be able to talk back and forth with consumers like this in this kind of closed space. Uh, so two brands, two different strategies there, but still always focusing on the community. Yeah, for Papa John's, uh, only one brand. And so our strategy um, involves community management. A lot of our, one thing we've noticed is a lot of our uh, fan base on social is very entertainment driven. Um, so very interested in TV, video games, sports, obviously with pizza being 
kind of an event driven food. Um, it's meant to be enjoyed with other people. I think that's the beauty of pizza. It's you don't buy pizza typically just for yourself. You buy it for a group. And so, well, maybe that's well. There's we have Papa too. So those are you know for sake for people by themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but so we we try to take that in mind um, in our strategy with community engagement. Um, we try to foster pizza eating occasions um, and talk about things that are relevant. Um, with our community and obviously connect one-to-one. -one. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but we do a lot in terms of surprise and delight. Um, we're constantly giving out codes for free items and we will always want to make it right, of course, in terms of customer service. Um, but we'll even, you know, if we see great user-generated content on Instagram stories, we'll uh, repost that to our feed and kind of make uh, our biggest brand fans feel a little bit more credible and a little bit um, like influencers, uh, if you will. So I think um, as the primary community manager, um, that's, a, that's a lot of what my role um, centers around is creating that one-on-one -on -one connection um, and relating back to those people um, with topics that, that are relevant to them. Thanks. And um, we manage a, a community group. I think it's on the next slide. You can We have a little visual for it uh, on Facebook that is called, here we go, uh, Sky Miles Life. So um, beyond our brand accounts, Sky Miles Life is a Facebook group um, with now almost 40,000 members. At the beginning of the year, there were 20,000 to, to give you an idea of how quickly it's growing. It's only a little bit more than two years old. Um, but this is where we you know, manage and curate a group of the most brand loyal Delta customers. So if you fly Delta and you're not on here, go on here. You'll find a lot of tips and tricks. Uh, people talk about, you know, is this worth it? You know, we're, I've got this opportunity to fly Delta One for 12,000 miles. Is it worth it? And they have conversations about it. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is. Um, we have found such an immense amount of value from this that I lose track of what all the business cases are. I was actually telling, we have a whole team devoted to this. And I was telling the audience engagement manager today is like, you're going to like, we're, we're going to do a better job of summarizing this because there, there are just like too many things for me to remember. Um, but one of the big ones is feedback. So we use this group for feedback on all types of things, whether it's like products or announcements we're going to make. Um, they a lot of times would test bet uh, for uh, the decisions that we make um, or even uh, hosting them uh, in three to four weeks uh, on campus. We're going to have about a dozen of these folks uh, for our first ever Sky Miles Life Summit. They're going to meet with our leaders. They're going to you know, see what um, the business looks like from the back end. They're going to give us their, their thoughts and everything. We're giving them lots of swag. They like swag. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's really a value add on both sides. And what happens is, you know, you've got a uh, benefit for them, benefit for us. We have a full um, team of moderators who talk to them all the time. They're considered, you know, basically celebrities in this group. And they become uh, connected in a, in a very real way. Like, it's, this is not surface. I've got a, um, an example of a screen cap here from earlier this week where one of our mods reached out to one of the members of the group that she knew. And it says... Um, hi, Joni. I'm Andrea, one of the mods from the Sky Miles Live Facebook group. I'm sure you have a ton of people. I, I should give you the background on this. She's based in Tel Aviv. Okay. Um, and, and this was earlier this week. I uh, just wanted to check on you to make sure uh, personally that you've, uh, since you provided the group with so many beautiful posts about Tel Aviv, when my first post as a mod, you encouraged me to add it to my list and it's been there ever since. I know it's a difficult situation to say the least, but I'd love to hear from you. She says, uh, thank you so much. It means the world to me. And then she goes on to explain that she's a news reporter. And um, it's <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, I know the way we're seated right now. Um, but she she, men she mentions in her first uh, text back, I'm just so scared, which to me is like, that's not a thing you say to a stranger, right? Like, who do you who do you tell? I'm just so scared. You say that to your, your good friends, your family. And that is the kind of connection that the people on my team have with the people in the group. Um, and it's, it's, it's real. Like I mentioned, I think I, I like to say that IRL is the new internet. Um, if you want to reuse that, feel free. I didn't actually make that up, but, um, I do, I do think it's true. I think that this is, uh, this is our in into the real world. This is how social becomes real for us. Um, 
So community is incredibly important for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of, again, pivoting or building, I should say, building off that topic, one of my favorite things to talk about is what is influencers and, and disrupting kind of the profession perception of what an influencer is and the power of influence that that humans have. I, I know, again, uh, earlier they talked about the psychology of humans want to connect with humans, humans don't want to connect with brands. And that's never been more true uh, than it is today. And so, you know, the last uh, last quick thing I want the team to kind of talk about a little bit is, is these non-traditional influencers and, and how people have brought borrowed equity and real human conversations to drive, again, brand stories forward uh, and sell the brand in ways that I know, again, brand marketers love to talk about themselves, but, you know, that they could never say, you know, in their own words. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to the team to talk a little bit on that. It's for us at Papa John's, um, we've had a unique approach um, with non-traditional influencers. Uh, we've actually started a program working with our store team members um, to create content. And we've noticed, actually started um, in the mentions, of course, for me, when I noticed several of our store team members were posting content from the stores. And instead of policing that content and looking at it as a negative, we looked at it as an opportunity um, because those team members are, they're building individual communities, they're building credibility with their followers, and they have authenticity just as, you know, the primary demographic on TikTok. Um, typically, our store workers or delivery drivers are, you know, Gen Z um, and younger, and they're in on the trends every day. So we saw that happening, and we saw the positive response. Um, a lot of the pizza makers will spin the dough and, and that does really well um, in terms of just TikTok views and engagements. Um, so we started a always on ambassador program working with those team members and we've <laughs> used them in a variety of campaigns. We work with them on our Doritos Papadilla campaign um, where they claim that they came up with the idea for the Papadilla in the stores. Um, and we also worked with them on a Chacaroni Dance Challenge campaign. We saw there was a, a young uh, pizza maker and her handle was the dancing delivery driver. And we love that. And she was very, you know, brand safe. Um, so we worked with her to kind of create some choreography for this dance. Um, I don't know if we have examples, um, but I believe, yeah, so we don't have to watch them all, but we can watch uh, the dancing delivery drivers. Um, Continue. <coughs> Yeah, so it was cute, and, and it, it, it goes a long way in terms of building um, that community and the connection with our store team members. Um, and, and it's a, it's great in terms of budget as well. We obviously commission them for this content, um, outside of their hourly rate. And we always check with, you know, the stores management to make sure they're in good standing, but, um, it's been a success for us so far and, uh, something we hope to continue to do in the future. I think the next slide, um, or next and two slides, one more. Uh, yes. So, um, Granted, she is a celebrity, but um, <laughs> this came about in a way that um, I think it's it's a the thematic that a lot of our brands and teams have embraced, but shoot your shot. Like you have nothing to lose. It costs you nothing. Um, so back in 2020, Billie Eilish did an interview with Vanity Fair where she said like, she just always thought like she just wanted and saw in her future. Like, I'm just, I just want to go and work at Jamba Juice. Like, I just want to make smoothies um, and talking about and reflecting on, on her career. And um I don't know there this should pop up, but um we saw that and we sent her a custom box of um material. So she we did a bedazzled and a personalized Jamba tumbler, we did the hat, we did the apron, and we saw nothing. We did not hear anything, nothing happened. Obviously, you also know what happened in 2020. Um, but fast forward to was it 2022? Um she posted a video that she took of herself back in 2020 when she got the package and you'll see in the video she's literally like crying and when she posted it she talks about how like in the craziness of everything we all were dealing with getting this little box made her be like 
I just, oh my gosh, I'm just so emotional. And I think that all boils up to one, shoot your shot, but two, like we are all just humans, no matter who you are. And when you connect with somebody one-to-one, you can get something super magical that can happen for your brand. And, um, you know, and since we've talked with our team, we do not have the money to afford a partnership with her, but, um, something as simple as this. And she just talks about, um, how it just meant so much to her to get something like that from a brand. Um, you know, just highly encourage you all to think through that same lens. There's one more. Um, so that was brand loyalists. Oh, brand collabs and partnerships. Um, Again, shooting your shot and engaging with communities. Um, as you build, um, you know, as we build our communities, we're always we're looking for opportunities to partner with other brands um, that uh, have similar audiences that we, that we see we are aligned in some way, shape, or form. I don't think if anybody told you Cinnabon and Slim Jim has a crossover, you would believe it, but there is. And last year, uh, we just started engaging with them on social, and it led up to. Um, us being boyfriend and girlfriend, um, and the, uh, the fans went crazy for it. Like fan accounts were made, um, it, it, we were dubbed Slimabon, um, and we just had so much fun engaging with each other's audiences and communities. And people would talk about how they were going to Cinnabon when they were core Slim Jim fans or how they were always thinking about us. Our fans were doing the same with them, um, which led to a couple like um, now it's been a month ago, um, we Slim Jim proposed and we got married and we hosted a, mar a, a wedding on Twitter. Um, yes, we still call it Twitter. We will not call it X. Um, but we hosted a wedding where it was like a week long of us engaging with our community and saying, where should we go for our honeymoon? Who should like, what, what's going on? We're going on our, our bachelorette or bachelor parties. Like, where are we going? So like sit, sit on, we went to Nashville. Um, but it was all based on community engagement and working um, with our teams and, we wanted to keep it super authentic. So yes, it was planned and certain elements were, but we also let the community direct where we took this um, fun collab. Um, it, we even got went so far as to uh, giving, we worked with uh, the Slim Jim culinary team and they made a product that combined Cinnabon and Slim Jim. We posted a recipe. Um, and then we also did a bunch of surprise and delight kits that were our wedding favors for those who attended our wedding. Um, and surprise and delighted uh, several fans with a box of Slim Jim Cinnabon gift cards. Some We did custom t-shirts. Um, I don't have a, a shirt up here. Um, very tacky, very tacky shirt. Looks like you'd buy it at a gas station, but it was all part of just the fun and embracing the two True. brand voices, the brand essences. Um, and again, just finding the, the uh, unique opportunities and the little moments of magic that you can uncover when you just take a little bit of a double click into uh, where your audiences may lead you. Super. Awesome. And we've, I think on the last slide we have, um, so an example. So, um, we in general focus on brand ambassadors who are a little bit more of the micro side. Like we like people with specific messages so that we know who to call, um, when we want to get a message out there. Um, this is an example of a partnership with uh, a gentleman named Fritz does art. Anyone's familiar. He does, a lot of this kind of ASMR painting. And uh, this was a way for us to make, this was uh, kind of a, a, a new route. It wasn't a, a route announcement, but it was examination of a new route. Uh, to, I think, I believe this one was to Auckland, as might be Shanghai. Um, yeah, Auckland, sorry. Um, where we just give folks an ASMR experience and, um, <laughs> give people a reason to stay on our channel and listen and watch our content. I think there's, there's video for this. You don't have to do the whole thing. That's good. It goes on from there. It's a little bit longer form. Um, but just an opportunity for, for, uh, like, you know, if, if Delta is going to do something ASMR, what would it look like? Uh, and I think it came out nicely actually. And it, it had some really great, um, engagement and views as well. So, yeah. So as you can see, again, like for me, again, as a brand advertiser, as a, as coming from the agency side, the seeing again, across the categories, these brands kind of dive in head first to an uncharted 
territory, but really embrace it and, and create these relationships and this emotional connection like brings me so much joy um, and is a conversation I know will continue. And again, what we're doing today is definitely not what we're going to do tomorrow, um, but it, but it's exciting to see how the landscape changes and, and we'll continue the conversation <laughs> as the world evolves. Any, I know we're probably past time, uh, but any burning questions? Um, Marissa, how far are you going to take this Slim Jim and Well, I mean, basically, the, the food product is was the baby, was what happened between the two of us. Um, but we, you know, that was one thing that was my challenge to my social media manager uh, for Cinnabon was how long are we going to continue to, to pull this out? And we, you know, we agreed that basically the wedding was the culmination of the relationship. Yes, we will still engage. We still still see value and want to continue to entertain both communities because we, this wasn't just a stunt for us. Um, we wanted to make sure that they felt a part of our community and we truly made them a part of, of Cinnabon. Um, and so we will continue to engage, but we were like, okay, this is the peak and we will start to simmer. We actually, we debated like, do we, leave each other at the altar? Like, do we just not do the wedding? Because we were looking for opportunities to say, okay, this, this is, um, cause the fans were wanting more and more. And we were like, how long are we going to continue to, to play this track? Um, but, but yes, this was the culmination of the relationship. <laughs> are we uh, around Billy Eilish? <laughs> yes, no, it was. And that's the, the great part that we have seen. Even you saw it on the Slim Jim one too. We, um, we work very closely with our PR team and they are fantastic advocates for the work that we're doing in the social space. And some of it is what our team will know we're doing and will proactively pitch out. And some of it is reactive. And when we see that it is garnering media attention, we take that and we amplify it and we see how much more we can get. Is there an extra layer in that extra click, which Again, as I was talking with before, we don't expect everybody to be experts in all areas, but I do expect my team to understand what does have that, that media cachet that media are going to be interested in and make sure that they're working with their PR counterparts to ensure they're aware of all of our work and can amplify it in other channels um, and make the most of what we're doing. Maybe just from an energetic point of view and emotional and budget, how do you divide your time among the platforms? Just like big percents. I how much between TikTok and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram? Is there an easy answer to that? I'll like quickly. I mean, we, we, we like yeah, TikTok. well, for Gen Z, um, I mean, that's the hard part. Like, TikTok is where we see, obviously, a lot of opportunity with Gen Z, but it is the wild, wild west out of all of the platforms. Like, what will pop off one day is not a magical recipe to lead to future content that will perform. And so it takes a lot of time and effort. And to be honest, coming in, I was very concerned with the amount of time that my team was spending trying to figure out how to break through on TikTok, um, knowing that we have all of these other platforms that you can't ignore. Um, but they have been able to convince me that the time is worth it. Um, and again, some some brands, like it just, TikTok isn't gonna work for them. We've tried and tried and tried. Some brands aren't, aren't moving forward and it's our job to understand where are our communities and go where they are. Don't try and make a platform happen can't make fetch happen. Um, so we're going where the opportunities are. Um, and hopefully that's all reflective of the larger demographic that we know is going to build our business. Yeah. Quick answer to that. So, um, I try to think of it in terms of a customer life cycle and TikTok to me is way over on the brand marketing side. And then the other platforms are, you know, more and more over on performance marketing. I think, in general, um, the median uh, age on TikTok is about 30. Um, our average customer is 45, right? Our average Facebook um, group member is 46 years old. So this is a massive oversimplification, but I think of it as um, we want to engage customers in their 20s on TikTok. And then we want to share experiences with them on Instagram in their 30s. And then in their 40s, we want them to really join our community, become one of us, share with us um, on Facebook and in the group. Um, so it's uh, massively uh, oversimplified, um, but we in general spend equal time on all three of those platforms. And Coca-Cola. Liquid you're gonna call me out there. <laughs> um, you know this as well as anyone, it depends by brand. I mean, we work really closely with our at-time experience of planning partners. And so I would say 
you know, from a media perspective, certain brands are going to over index on meta and certain brands, like you're saying some brands just don't work on TikTok. Like if you look at Coke trademarks, TikTok right now, we have a massive following. We don't do much with it. It doesn't do much for us right now. Maybe we'll crack it. We're also really new to TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. Just legally, we couldn't even get on the platform until 2022, which is so weak. So it, it depends by brand. It's, I guess I would, what I would say. So then what about Snap Dad? Snap is such a huge debate for us right now. Um, from a media perspective, we still spend massive amounts of money with Snap, but you're really not seeing the engagement that you used to see. I would say same with X. Um, we don't play in the organic X space as much as I would say like versus brands do, but for some brands we've actually even sunsetted X and said the ROI on organic is just not there anymore. Smart water, you will not see us organically on X. Um, you'll see us lean really heavily into Instagram. I have a question for Carson. Um, so you mentioned that your teams have their own TikToks and their baking content. How do you guys go about finding them? And obviously you're not policing them, but also making sure it's like on break. Yeah, so we found them, really it was just me being in the mentions and seeing them tag the brand. A lot of them will reach out uh, proactively to the brand. Um, they're really passionate about working for Papa John's. Um, and in terms of how we, I guess not police, but like you said, make sure it's on brand is we'll, we'll actually schedule meetings um, with these team members if it's for a larger campaign. Um, we'll share our brand guidelines. They sign an influencer agreement just like any other influencer would. Um, and we, like I said, we check with uh, their store's management. So the first thing we'll do before we even reach out to them is reach out to the franchisee or if it's corporate store, you know, the store operator. Um, and we make sure that are they a good employee or a good team member besides what they're doing on, you know, are you aware that they have this social platform and are they in good standing with you guys? And if the answer is yes and they approve, then we move forward in contacting the team member. We also work with legal very closely on this as well, just to make sure we don't have any issues. We have to brief them on music rights and, you know, different things they can say and what they can say. Um, in the past, we've seen issues where they'll call competitors and that's not something we want to, we want to do, um, if they're a representative of us. So, um, it's a long process, but, um, I think it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's done, a um, it's done a lot in terms of just uh, connecting the store team members with the national brand. And because if you think about it, those are the people that whenever you order pizza and you go in to pick it up, those are the people you're seeing. That's the closest to the product. They know how to make the product for anybody else. So um, we're really happy um, with how it's turned out. And I think, well, what we've really seen is um, since we started doing that, a lot more team members have, have caught on to this and they want to create positive content for the brand. They um, they see it's being rewarded, so they want to make positive content as well. Uh, Rick, I have a question for you. Typically in comment sections, like that's a very obvious and open place to build community. You probably see more customer complaints in a day than some brands see in a lifetime, <laughs> how do you manage building a community and also enabling customer service in such a public forum? And also, to add on to that, so recently with all the changes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tell you about that when you were like, hey, how are people coming into the office? And I was like, to talk about the loyalty program? <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me address uh, that question that literally everyone in this room has. <laughs> No, I know. <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily, um, our CEO made a public statement, I believe it was early last week, or maybe the week before, in front of the Rotary Club, uh, where he talked about the fact that um, he believes that we had gone too far in making Scott Miles changes and that he expected to see um, some, some updates to those programs. I can't speak any further on top of what uh, the man himself said. So I'll just let that um, in terms of like live there. Looking into his question though, right? Because it's absolutely something that all of us that are in brand marketing should, you know, should think about is yeah. well, if that did happen, how would we address that or on social? What is our strategy? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of internal debates about um, comments. 
I mean, we have, you know, obviously a, a team devoted to making comments and responding to comments. Um, you know, when you have a lot of negativity, it, does that mean that you stop posting? Because if you post something, no matter what it is, you're going to get a lot of blowback or do you stand up for um, what you believe and continue to get your message out there? Um, and I think where we've landed today is when we have a message we feel really strongly about, go out there. If people are going to go in the comments and get nasty, let them go in the comments and get nasty. It's, it's, their, it's their right. Um, but I think as a, as a channel that has a message to put out there on behalf of the brand and on behalf of ourselves, um, it's our responsibility to continue to post, um, you know, leading with values first. I think our team does a, a fantastic job of when we do get really unnecessary, you know, sometimes derogatory or bigoted comments, um, we respond with values led messages that we've talked about for weeks. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see if you go back on some of our Instagram posts about Prime Week, um, where we have uh, some, some really unfortunate responses to that. And I think my team's uh, response to those comments speak for themselves and are, are, are beautiful um, in terms of like, um, you know, a comment saying, you know, just fly planes. Our response is, we don't just fly planes. Like we, we connect people and this is one of the ways that we connect people. So I think um, your beliefs are really important to that. You have to know what your beliefs are and if um, uh, they're important to you, then you stand up for them and you continue to put your message out there regardless of what uh, the commenters might say. Great, that'll be our last question. Thank you all so much.